Uh, so, my name is Robert Arnott. Um, thank you for the introduction. At Andromeda Entertainment, um, I'm going to give a, a brief introduction to who I am, what I'm doing, and then I'm going to jump into some the weeds on some uh, on a psychological framework that I really like, and then move into looking and analyzing parts of the wellness economy that I think can be made a lot better. Okay, so I'm the CEO and co-founder of Andromeda Entertainment. We are a gaming company, a gaming publishing company, but uh, we're focused exclusively on titles that draw inspiration from wellness. So what this means is that the, the, the game designs that we are working on shipping are all the more entertaining and powerful because they actually nourish you in some really deep way, rather than just aiding you and distracting yourself or something like that. Um, oh, I've lost my slides. Can I get the slides back? Thanks. Um, so I was going to be talking about transcendence and game design as a mechanism for transcendence, and I'll get into that a little bit, but I've spoken quite a bit on the topic of game design and transcendence, and so I actually wanted to take this as an opportunity to explore something I've been thinking about, and so this is a little new to me, but I, and as such, I will really appreciate your questions at the end of this. My talk's going to be ending at about 12, but uh, if you'll stay in here for uh, a little bit into the lunch period, then we can get into a little bit of a discussion, and I really welcome your feedback. So, I'm going to be talking about um, who here has even a, um, like a, a preliminary or cursory understanding of integral theory? Okay, cool. Not as many as I was anticipating. This is great. Uh, integral theory is a psychological theory that I found to be an incredibly useful window into understanding not only myself and the people around me, but also understanding movements and flows in my culture and, and helping me ask intelligently, how can I aid not only the psychological development of myself and my friends and so on, but aid and play into the psychological development of my culture. So I'm going to begin by going a little bit into, let's go to the next frame, please, uh, as soon as you've got that going. Uh, so I'm going to get, begin this talk by, there we go, uh, next frame. Others, I'll just like snap my fingers when we, is that okay? Yeah. Thank you, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be uh, using integral psychology, this frame, to analyze current paradigms of health technologies, health economies, and our relationship with our body as a whole. Uh, spoiler alert, by the way, I think one of the big issues with health technologies and the way we treat our bodies is it's, it can be pretty joyless and boring and uninspiring. And, uh, and from that place, I'm going to be offering some not-so-boring steps forward. But first, we have to just go through a little introduction to integral psychology. Next frame, please. All right. So two models that I'm really into. On the left, we have Ken Wilber's map, which is sort of the defining integral psychology map. Uh, and on the right here, we have the eye consciousness map, which um, is a newer map that is a lot more... Um, High fidelity, and I'm going to be going into both of these a little bit. Um, the fundamental belief of integral psychology, or, or sort of what makes it pretty groundbreaking, is it's this understanding that psychological development proceeds through these discrete shifts. So it's not that you fade from one stage of psychological development to another stage of psychological development. It's actually that your whole frame of looking at the world, once, once all the pieces are in place for it, has a radical transformation. And so suddenly, who you are doesn't look so much like who you were maybe a few months ago. So, I mean, who here can remember a time in their life where like, suddenly who you are now and who you were a few months ago are radically different people, right? Almost all of you. What was probably happening for you is that you gathered enough data in your life over the last you know, few years to create a new model of reality for yourself. And then your whole mind and your whole way of looking at the world underwent a transformation to update to that new reality. Now, the thing is, it's not a different path for everybody. We all go from one stage to the next to the next. So in childhood, you, Everybody here was three years old at, old at some point, and when you were three years old, you were going through a, a stage of development called primary narcissism. This means that you can't expect a three-year-old to have empathy and care for the people around them because they're just not capable of it yet. 
in order to get to the place where you can have empathy and care for other people, as I'm sure all of you do, um, you had to first go through a stage of your development in childhood where you became really intimate with the experience of need in the primary place where it felt in the body, which means you had to be a narcissistic little asshole for a little while before you could become who you are today. It's the same with these stages of psychological development as we keep going. And in fact, where what we call childhood ends is just where the stages of development have encoded in our culture. So our culture helps bring us up through these stages of development up to a certain point. And we call that point adulthood. But there are more stages of discrete development available to us. All right, let's go to the next slide. Each stage of psychological development builds upon the prior stage. So I'm going to be focusing on two stages in particular in this talk that are particularly relevant to our culture and particularly relevant to our institutions. Next slide, please. All right. So, um, excuse me while I catch up with myself here a minute. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and describe these two stages. So um, that lower stage there, orange, and this upper stage here, green, are, I think, the basic tension of, of what we are, a, a cultural shift, a cultural psychological shift that our culture is undergoing right now. So the orange stage, each of these is color-coded. The orange stage is um, concerned with... Uh, um, it's, it's a rationalistic stage. So our, our culture considers once, once you're capable of basic rationalism, that's when you're an adult. Hold on one moment. I apologize. Okay, okay. Thanks. I just wanted to kind of catch up with my structure and make sure I don't get ahead of myself. Um, something, the stage ahead of that, which is this green stage, is a, a kind of postmodern stage where, where now we're concerned with pluralism and making sure everything is included. What we notice, is there's this spiral pattern here. And what that means is we're going back and forth, back and forth, spiraling upwards. But from a certain position, it can seem like moving from yin to yang, yin to yang. And, uh, and it can look like progression, regression, progression, regression. But actually, it's a, it's a back and forth upward motion. So let's look at orange. Next stage, Next slide, please. Next slide, please. No, no. There we go. All right. And I'm going to be focusing on how we relate to the body through each of these psychological stages. OK, so in the, the orange paradigm, which is uh, you were probably entering this paradigm when you were a teenager, 18-year-old thereabouts, just entering adulthood. The real breakthrough in this stage of consciousness is we're able to break down reality systemically. And we do that by reducing reality into its component pieces. And you can pull on those component pieces. And what's amazing about that is we can build giant machines and institutions. And our relationship with the whole world and with our body becomes rather mechanical. right? A machine is mechanical. That's kind of the operating metaphor. Of, of our reality at this stage. So how does this play out in our systems of healing? Once we have a mechanical relationship with the body, what does the healing modality look like? What does the relationship with the body as it's encoded in institutions look like? All right. Well, first, <laughs> knowing yourself is, and I, you're all familiar with the medical model, and it's, so I'm going to go down this and, and, and identify some of the things that's really cool about it, but also what's outdated about this, okay? So knowing yourself is displaced outward into the machine, into a system of expertise. Sovereignty is even considered rather dangerous in the medical model. You can't take authority over your own body. You're not really allowed to, and if you are, that's uh, seen as kind of antisocial, um, stupid. You really have to trust in the system. The body is treated as inherently broken and destined to betray us. And this is because once you've broken down the world into its mechanical pieces, there is a fundamental separation between your experience of your mind and your experience of your body. And there tends to be an identification with the mind. And your mind will be betrayed by your body. 
because your mind cannot comprehend death. But your body will die. Okay, so that's a paradox. That you're, you're, you're not really, from this frame of reality, you're not really prepared to accept and understand that paradox. It, it is a, a brokenness that's built into this modality of thinking. So, I want to offer you all a question here. Um, what happens when you lie? So let's say you and I are in a monogamous relationship, and you cheat on me. What's your world like now? And I mean this, you know, um, like, like, please, as somebody pop up for me, just think of a time, yes, please, what's your world look like when you lie? Uh, you're talking about more how everything becomes something where you're trying to hide, becomes slightly more paranoid because you have to make sure that the lies believe the whole life turns into a hundred lives. It turns into a hundred lives, right? Your life becomes messy, and your whole way of being it starts to carry so much weight, and, and, um, there's so much inertia there, right? Um, that's what happens when you lie. Your life becomes a tangle and you can't be present anymore when you lie. So, let's look at the medical model and what this looks like in our culture. Doctors are incentivized to over-test, over-diagnose, and over-prescribe. Insurance companies are incentivized to over-promise and over-charge. Pharma is incentivized to create complex solutions to, to simple problems because you can't profit from the solution if it's a simple solution. Patients are incentivized to continuously intervene in their body's natural healing process and to displace their sovereign authority over their body onto others. Every chain of the system is pushing off responsibility onto another part of the system. This looks a lot to me like what my life looks like when I'm lying. So what's the lie at the center of this system? Anybody? That the system has the right answer. That is, that is definitely one of the lies, that the system has the right answer. But the system doesn't have the right answer, because why? Because it's trying to do something it can't. It's trying to protect us from dying. At the center of the medical model is the belief that you shouldn't die. And so the place where the medical model is cruelest is end of life. All right. This whole system is a denial of the reality of death, and consequently a persistent pushing off of responsibility onto every element of the system. If that's why it's so expensive, that's why it's so messy, and that's why I think we can't fix it. Because it's built on a lie, and it's lies built on lies. I really don't think there's any fixing the medical model. I don't think we're going to improve it iteratively. I think it's fucked. Okay. And I think the only way... I don't think we can fix this, but I think we can build an alternative model of well-being that, because it is not necessarily based on a lie, can beat this model in the market. Next slide, please. Oh yeah, that's what the medical model looks like. There we go. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so what does that model look like? Let's begin if the medical model emerged from a certain stage of consciousness development that's color-coded orange. Let's see what uh, Green has to say about the relationship with the body. Next slide. And for this, I'm going to go back to um, the I-conscious model of integral psychology. This is a newer model that I really like. Next slide, please. They've broken this down. This is really cool, by the way, so I'm just going to jump here for a moment. You know, Ken, Ken Wilber's integral model ends here. And these guys have outlined uh, what stages psych, of psych, psychological development all the way up to here. So, this is orange, and this is green. So let's look at the next slide here and see what this model has to say about our relationship with the body at this stage of development. Next slide. So, the body, at the orange stage of development, what we do is we try to micromanage my body for perceived pain. At the green stage of consciousness development, which is more concerned with pluralism and accepting all of the pieces and purging trauma, we're trying to seek harmony by purifying or manipulating the body. So what does an economic model of well-being look like from a green perspective? Next slide, please. All right. As I said, there's a back and forth with the spiral. Remember, the spiral looks like this. But if you're standing still, or sitting still as you are, what that looks like is a back and forth. 
All right, so there's an inhalation, exhalation, expansion, contraction. The orange stage contracts the identity of the individual, which is why so much of liberal culture is concerned with individualism. The green stage expands the identity out into a, a pluralistic identity that tries to include everything. <coughs> the achievement of orange is systematization. The achievement of green is uh, accessibility in a lot of ways, because what Green's trying to do is identify the, the, the things that are not met by the reductionist systematization. So give access to, for example, wellness to more people. And the relationship with, with the body goes from being a mechanical relationship to one where we're identifying toxicity and trauma and purging that and purifying. All right. So this is a... Um, Let's look at how this plays out. Let's look at what an alternative to the medical model can be. And, and that, that is, of course, the wellness model. Next page, please. We have these kitschy brands that are like appealing directly to the consumer. So instead of, like, if you go to a doctor and get a pill, you have no idea who's profiting from what. You have no idea what the trail of money looks like. You don't know where the pill's coming from. You don't know the re I mean, I mean, it's a big black box, and it's designed to be a big black box. This is a big improvement through nutrition, through meditation, through yoga, through exercise, and so on, we're kind of taught to take care of our bodies, and we're given an opportunity to at least have a direct relationship with some kind of cutesy, kitschy brands. So that's nice. But, okay, I'm not really here to pat anyone on the back, and while that's nice, it, it's still not, it's still kind of broken. And it's inherited some of the brokenness of the previous models, but uh, it has some elements of brokenness. I mean, look, this is less of a lie, which is why these institutions are less convoluted and messy. It's not built on the you do not have to die lie. So I'm going to look at one of these brands in particular. Next page, please. This is Headspace. Um, and they're easy to poke fun at because they're a really... Uh, benevolent company that's doing a lot of good work. So I don't think anyone's going to mind if I try to knock their feet out from under them a little bit. Um, I was seeing ads like this on Facebook uh, around the time of the new year. Do you all remember ads like this for Headspace? No? A few of you. What is this ad doing? I, you know, it's cute. It's appealing. It's friendly. It's not a big black box like the medical model. But it's not appealing to the part of you that's, that's proud and joyful to be alive, you know? It's appealing to your inner parent, which believes there's something that you need to do to get better. There's a quality of shooting in this advertisement, which is particularly ironic for a brand that is teaching meditation. Um, in my exploration of wellness spaces, and wellness spaces are full of meditation technologies because meditation is, is like a huge thing that our cultural body needs right now. Um, this quality of shooting is utterly ubiquitous. So what's the lie? The lie in the medical model is you don't have to die. What's the lie in this model? Anyone? You're not mindful enough. You're not mindful enough. That's good. That's it. You're not good enough. There's something wrong with you. That's the lie. <laughs> Your baby, you need to be taken care of. That's good. That's good. All right. So if that's... Uh, Evan, go on. You're missing something. You're missing something. Good. Yes. All right. So if that's the lie of the wellness model, where do we go to from here? And I'm going to look again to integral psychology. Next page, please. So, oh, yeah, next page. There we go. There's something wrong with me. Ne yeah, where to next? Next page. We continue this breathing process. Thank you. As we go from orange to green to soul, at orange we contract into the individual. At green we expand into a pluralistic identity that tries to include everything. In teal, which is the next stage of psychological development, which, uh, so best el e estimates right now have about 30 to 40% of American culture in green. About 30% in green. Most of our culture is in orange, which is why the institutions are so dominantly orange. And until recently, it's all been orange, you know? So, so we, we, gotta, we gotta really, you, you, as much as I make fun of the medical model, we have to have compassion for it because we can't get to where we're going without going through the stages before. 
So the medical model really is a damn good model for doing a lot of good things, you know? Um, uh, it's, it's just easy to see how it's broken or ways it can be improved from here. So contracted into the individual, expanded into a pluralistic identity. There's another contraction in this stage. And best estimates have about 3 to 4% of American culture in this stage right now. There's a contraction again into the soul. The achievement of this stage is integrating wisdom from all the different stages and integrating wisdom from stillness and silence. So there's a kind of preoccupation with meditation and listening to silence. And the relationship with the body, again from the eye-conscious model, they say outdated body patterns begin to dissolve. I prefer the word maladaptive to outdated. I think that better describes it. But we begin to see the body-mind as an expression of truth. So sickness is no longer an enemy that has to be purged. Sickness is a, a friend or an ally. A, 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 um, you look to your sickness as, as, as a friend that teaches you where you need to go next. So let's say I, I, I got a back pain sometimes. And uh, when I'm feeling, you know, like I'm grumpy about it, then I want to purge my back pain. But when I'm feeling ready to meet my back pain, that friend that is my back pain, it teaches me something about my posture. It teaches me something about my habits. It teaches me some way to grow and expand and continue on my own evolutionary development. It's the same with, with any kind of sickness. Next page. So I think what the next economy of well-being looks like is one that does not, you know, say there's something wrong with you here. It's one that is focused on joy and transformation, purely for the joy of transformation. Transformation is a joyful process. So what can we do differently? <coughs> Instead of appealing to the parent, the inner parent, we can appeal to the inner child. We can appeal to our in innate sense of joy. So some great places that I think we, like one of the great things, this is the Body Hacks Conference. There's a lot of body modification here. There's something really cool about that, you know? It's kind of taboo in our culture to relate to the body in a way that takes sovereignty over the body, right? You're meant to relate to the body in a way that fixes it of all the broken ways it's broken. But, and it's kind of taboo to, to just take authorship over it and say, this body is mine. I'm going to let it be a raw expression of whatever I want it to be, right? So I think there's... Of the, there are some existing models, economic models, that, that the well-being and wellness models can borrow from to find new wisdom. Body modification is one of them. The temple and spirituality is another one. Medicine ceremonies are another one. But there's one that's kind of, might be kind of surprising because it's so embedded in our economy everywhere is the entertainment economy. You know? That, that which drives you to the entertainments you love. You don't listen to the music you listen to because you think you should or because you think it'll make you better. You do because you're mysteriously driven by some joy and recognition in the music. And who here feels like they've been changed and transformed by the art they've exposed themselves to? Right? Right. Who here feels like they've been changed and transformed by a pill they've taken? Right. I, I imagine there would be a few people, right? I, I, and so I don't mean that diminutively at all, because like medical, yeah, like I have. But joy is so much more powerful. So what are the entertainment industries doing right? They're, I mean, they're doing some things horribly, horribly, horribly wrong. But um, people are drawn to entertainments out of a raw sense of joy. You, you go to a movie or a piece of music from... You're just drawn to it, and you're open to it. Because it doesn't have that should quality, you, your soul is open to it. You let it into your, your body, mind, and it does its magic on you. So I remember the first time I saw the movie Children of Men, which was my favorite movie for a while. Anybody remember that movie? Yeah, that, I, when that movie ended, my jaw was just... Bah. But seeing that movie helped me touch something in myself that I'd never seen or felt before. And I got to... That movie is about um, birth, but it's about birth from a male frame. And, and through watching that movie, I got to feel the part of myself that needed to grieve for the fact that as having a male body, I'm never going to have the intimacy with a child that a mother can have. 
And that movie helped me grieve that, and in that grief helped me come more into alignment with body and love my body more. So, when we approach entertainments, because we're not asking our entertainments to fix us, we're, we're more open to them, and they can help us more. Mikey Seagal, um, let's go to the next page, uh, who some of you may have seen speak yesterday, I think. Uh, very, very, very smart person. He and I had a conversation on Friday um, about this. And what he said, which was really interesting to me, is that we're talking about unbiased feedback loops versus biased feedback loops. A biased feedback loop is one that tries to get you somewhere, and an unbiased feedback loop is one that shows you what's here already and allows the wisdom of your body and your soul to do its natural work. So there's a little QR code there if anybody would like to um, see that. Somebody's head is blocking that, if you wouldn't mind. If you could scoot forward just a little bit so that the QR code will work. Thank you. All right. So art, when it's channeled, art when it's not channeled is awful. OK. So there's some really bad art out there. But, but art when it's channeled is divine. It's healing. It comes. It works in a mysterious way. We don't, we don't, know, we don't know why it, it does what it does to us. And, and, and as an artist myself, I, I can't even quite design it. You know? It's so personal. But there's something at play here that, that transcends the logical mind. So stories, for example, can help us reframe our hero's journey. And uh, next page, please. And that QR code is just still going to be there, so you, you can uh, grab that if you want. Video games even more so, because a video game doesn't just invite, that doesn't just tell you a story. And what a story does, by the way, here's what a story is psychologically. A story is a, an image that you can project your identity into. And when you project your identity into it by feeling yourself in the characters and so on, you, you feel yourself in different ways. And you get to kind of stretch out your identity in different ways. And the more stories you expose yourself to, the more deeply you expose yourself to stories, the more you kind of get to do an identity exercise. Video games are, in a lot of ways, even more powerful because they actually give us an environment to act out and to embody some new way of being. So our games over here, which I think are, are both really beautiful titles, um, the one that you see on the screen, that's Rave Runner. Uh, the designers of Rave Runner are here. That's a game that there's no narrative to it. it. It just invites you into movement. and invites you to feel your body. It invites you to come alive and dance. And in our culture, we desperately need to come alive and to dance more. Sound Self is the other title there. That's the project I've designed over the last seven years. It's a meditation experience. And through playing this meditation experience, you're invited to act out <coughs> a pattern that allows you to sink into witnessing yourself free from the ego patterns that you're used to identifying with. So compare a relationship with this or with art or with whatever your favorite musician is. Compare what that does for your body mind to what something like Headspace does to your body mind, you know? Like, like imagine your favorite musician and imagine the time you've listened to them which has a bigger impact on you? Is it that relationship, or is it a relationship with something like Headspace, or a wellness app, something that's, that's helping you be better at the thing you're meant to be better at? Or is it a relationship with, with, um, with a doctor, someone who's telling you what you need to, who's, who's holding the keys to um, massive systems of, of, of Western healing? I think that whatever the integral economy for healing is, and we're only just beginning to see this emerge, I think it's going to derive its content from gaming. And from stories. All right, and that's, that's all I have to say on this topic. So, Next any slide. questions? <laughs> Next slide, thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Can we do that next slide, please?
Could you do the next slide, please? Oh, you don't have it? There. There we go. Perfect. All right. Any, any questions? Yes. That's a really good question. I, I think that, and actually I, what I'm about to describe is something I think we're already beginning to see. I, I, think that, um, I think that practitioners can benefit from seeing themselves as artists. And um, we don't currently have the institutional framework to support that as well as we have, as effectively as we have the institutional framework to support a practitioner seeing themselves as a pharmaceutical delivery mechanism. But, um, so it requires a lot of bravery, and it probably requires taking a hit on income for the, for the time being, until we see a radical transformation of the economy, and, um, and, and then, you know, good luck to anybody who, who didn't transform their, their practice in the meantime. But, but yeah, I think it's seeing yourself as an artist and following your own intuition and uh, relating to your clients on a really intimate level. I think I met some 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 people who are doing that with their practices. Yes. So you, you said about this contraction and this package. Yeah. And you were saying this one, the last one that you were showing about the joy it was a contraction moment. Yeah. Yeah. What is the next one? Like, what is the model for the next one? There's already something there. Or? Yeah, the, that's been mapped out. Um, very 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 small minority of the population is in that that stage. Um, it's color coded turquoise. I can't speak to it as intelligently as I could speak to these three because my own uh, consciousness models can't quite fit it. But um, I'll try. I'll try to describe it now. Um, and there's a release of identity and um, a kind of surrender into the uh, more of a surrender into the God mind. Um, so the soul is a, a quiet listening to the individual expression of the God mind, and but the God mind is eternal and universal, and, and there's a surrender to the the uh, uh, like surrendering one's actions to the the will of the God mind. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, just a, just a, my own understanding of Please, it is, yeah. is, uh, is that the orange and green are individual mind and collective mind, kind of, collective knowledge. Yeah. And this goes to individual soul and collective soul. Nice, nice. So there's something in the individual collective that the spiral goes back and forth on. Yeah. Which is, uh, and it's a very, it's, it, you're right, it's very difficult to actually envision what does that mean. Yeah, especially, especially from, from a, 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 an right. earlier stage of development. Right. Um, so just to repeat what David said um, for anybody listening here, it's in the orange and green we have a swing back and forth between the individual and collective mind, and in the uh, teal and turquoise we kind of move from the individual to collective soul. Yeah, thank you. All right, any more questions? Yes. I think Ray Kurzweil is. Um, addicted to his body staying alive. Yes. Um, and uh, I think that's a dangerous set of ideas, and I think he's going to die. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's as scared as hell for that. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think he's also a very smart man who has a lot of very smart things to say. I just think that, I think anything anyone has to say that is trying to avoid dying is, is uh, dangerous. <laughs> Wow, that's judgmental of me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lungs, enjoy your body hat. Thank you. Thank you.